Wonderful. Okay, welcome everyone to the 2017 August CCL Canada Education Call. Tonight we have on our call Yannick Troche. Some of you may know him because he's a fellow CCLer here in Canada and he has been with us since at least 2013, maybe a little bit before then. 2013. Uh, 2013, yes. I remember him from the conference and his awesome costume which you can see on our Facebook page. Anyways, um, Yannick has a, a degree from MIT in aerospace engineering as well. He took a 12-week course from MIT as well in climate change. He worked as a nuclear engineer or in the nuclear industry for nine years before stepping back to devote himself to the climate issue. He is a climate reality graduate um, and he has shared presentations with many professional groups across Canada and China, uh, as well as the professional engineering uh, organization in Ontario. Uh, Yannick previously shared his uh, knowledge about carbon capture and, se and sequestration with us in 2014. And this is an update because lots has happened in the last three years with carbon capture and sequestration. I am very happy to have Yannick on the call tonight. This, uh, this education is really important going forward because the, the target is constantly moving. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. If you have a question, uh, put it in the chat room. If you don't know where the chat room is, you can just put your cursor along the bottom of the screen and you'll see chat. And I will be monitoring the chat room. So that is during the first half hour, Yannick will be giving a presentation. He's already incorporated most of the questions that have given him, been given to him already in his call, in his talk. Um, thereafter, in the second half, uh, Yannick uh, will answer any questions you have. So I will be monitoring the chat room though. If I feel it's pertinent that it be asked right now, I will interrupt Yannick, otherwise it'll wait till the second half. So enjoy and Yannick, if you want to take over now, that would be great. Sure. I'm going to ma make another attempt to uh, fix the Venetian blinds here so I don't have the, the weird lighting on my face. Um, yeah, that's not bad. Okay. Uh, so, so thank you all for coming, and thank you, Kathy, for, for that introduction. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here and uh, start my slides uh, so that you should be seeing uh, at this point the... Um, uh, the uh, my uh, my header slide for carbon capture and storage is that right, Kathy? Yes, I can see it. Okay, so uh, I I uh, I became I first became interested in carbon capture and storage after reading reports from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, the world's leading body on on climate science, and they said that. CCS was a critical technology that we needed to get working in order to address this, this climate change uh, challenge. Uh, so I've been uh, trying to share that knowledge with as many activists that I, that I can. Uh, I wrote four of, of the laser talks that were distributed to you this month. I hope that you guys had a chance to read them uh, because today I'm not going to go through all of those details. I'm just going to give an, an overview of the whole issue and leave lots of time for questions at the end. Um, uh, carbon capture and storage is a general term for a range of different industrial processes that can separate carbon dioxide emissions from smokestacks and store them underground indefinitely as toxic waste, uh, kind of like radioactive waste. CCS is one of the ways that we have to keep producing cement, steel, and baseload electricity without aggravating climate change. It's one of the tools we have in, in our arsenal, and although it's, it's, there are other ways that we could achieve the same results, the climate crisis is so dire that I don't think we should be discarding any technological options that can help at this point. Uh, now, we, uh, Citizens Climate Lobby, uh, as an organization, is not for or against carbon capture and storage or any other specific technology. All that we want is for the price of carbon to reflect its true social cost. 
And specifically, we lobby for a carbon fee to be applied to fossil fuels at the wellhead or as far upstream as possible. But if a CCS plant captures its carbon and stores it permanently, should it pay the same price as a, uh, uh, as a plant that simply uses our atmosphere as an open sewer? Uh, of course not. They don't have the same impact on climate change. But if our carbon fee was applied at the wellhead and we didn't have any other uh, financial mechanisms behind it, then that cost at the wellhead would flow through to all power plants, whether regardless of whether they're using carbon capture or a simple smokestack draining carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So when the, uh, the REMI organization uh, uh, made, did a study to analyze CCL's policy uh, to evaluate its impact on climate change and the economy, they assumed that CCS plants would receive a refund for each ton of carbon that they put back underground uh, to cancel out the fee that would be applied when the carbon was taken out of the ground. With that assumption, Remy forecasted that CCS would be built at an industrial scale and that this would allow clean electricity uh, and other goods at reasonable costs. Remy concluded that our fee and dividend policy could reduce emissions without hurting the economy. And that's something that we've talked, that we've talked a lot about in, uh, in training our members and in talking to politicians. But that conclusion was dependent on their assumptions of, about carbon capture and storage. Here's the graph that they came up with, which was a, a forecast of where the United States would be getting its electricity uh, over the next few, uh, few decades under CCL's fee and dividend policy. Uh, so you, you have uh, the numbers on the left here are in units of terawatt hours, uh, and this may be small on your screen, but this is 2010, 2020, 2030, 2040. And I want you to note that this forecast relies on significant growth of uh, nuclear power, for one thing, and more importantly, carbon capture and storage, which would grow dramatically around 2030 and up. So Citizens Climate Lobby does not support carbon capture directly, but we do think that a properly designed carbon pricing system should support CCS, and then we would want to let the free market choose the most economically efficient options to produce electricity and goods and everything else we need. But aside from the economic efficiency arguments, there's a much more fundamental reason why we need carbon capture and storage technology. We're going to need this technology to remove carbon dioxide from our atmosphere. You see, carbon dioxide is different from other pollutants in that it doesn't really go away on its own, at least not on human timescales. It's more like plastics or uh, uh, radioactive waste. All of the anthropogenic carbon dioxide that we have been releasing over the last 150 years or so has been accumulating in the environment like water in a bathtub. And even if we were to eliminate all CO2 emissions, uh, that would just be like uh, turning off the faucet on, on this analogy. Uh, the, you'd stop filling up the, the, the tub, but the carbon dioxide would still be there, increasing temperatures. Uh, and if we leave it to nature to clean up, to drain the tub, it would take tens of thousands of years to drain away on its own. So we do need to shut off the faucet, stop making the problem worse, shut off emissions, but we also need to open up the drain. Because that bathtub is really full right now. You know, throughout humanity's existence until the industrial age, carbon dioxide levels varied between about 200 parts per million and 280 parts per million. Uh, that can be considered the safe range because we know that humans have lived through that before. But at the dawn of the industrial age, we were already at the top end of that safe range. And since then, all of the carbon that we've been pulling out of the ground and putting into at the atmosphere has raised that level up to 410 parts per million, far higher than anything humanity has ever seen. So scientists like James Hansen have, have looked at this and said to see what impact that would have on our world and found that 
it would be devastating. And if we wish to simply preserve a planet just similar to that on which civilization developed and to which life on Earth is adapted, we're going to have to reduce the carbon dioxide levels down from the current 410 ppm to at least 350 ppm or even lower if we care about saving even more lives. That's going to have to be done artificially. Uh, it's going to have a cost and we're going to have to pay for it. Uh, James Hansen said so himself in the very same paper that established the, the 350 ppm target. He said a rising price on carbon emissions and payment for carbon sequestration is surely needed to make the drawdown of airborne carbon dioxide a reality. Now, as a bit of an aside, I, I want to point out that this 350 ppm target was proposed back in 2008, and the science has evolved since then. Uh, James Hansen and his colleagues worked in units of straight carbon dioxide ppm, but it's more accurate to work in units of carbon dioxide equivalent ppm that take into account other greenhouse gases. And if we do that, that would mean that our current levels are at 489 ppm, and the two degree Celsius target that politicians have signed up to would be roughly equivalent to uh, 450 ppm. Uh, overall, that means that the overshoot is a little bit better, or looks to be a little bit better than what James Hansen feared, uh, but it is, we still have uh, already enough greenhouse gases in our atmosphere today to raise temperatures beyond 2 degrees Celsius if they were to stay there. So how do we reduce carbon dioxide levels? Well, we already have a simple and low technology way of doing bioenergy carbon capture and storage. And that's just called planting trees. Uh, and this does help, but it has some sharp limits. Uh, you need a tremendous amount of land in order to have a significant uh, impact. And forests already compete with agriculture for land use. So the IPCC has done the, the numbers or reviewed the numbers. And they found that there just isn't enough land on the planet to rely on this alone, especially when you think about how we're going to feed future populations of 12 billion people in the middle of a mega drought. The best we could do if we converted all available land back to forests would just be to reduce CO2 levels in our atmosphere by around 40 to 70 parts per million. And really the upper end of that range is grossly unrealistic. Uh, another option that comes up a lot is, uh, is uh, soil carbon. It can we, what can we do with better farming practices? And there are some things we can do there, uh, but this is much less effective per hectare of land, about half as effective as simply planting trees on that land. And on top of that, soil saturates quite quickly, faster than, than forests do. Uh, so this has, this has less potential even than forests for addressing this problem. Neither planting trees nor farming practices can remove enough carbon from our atmosphere to meet the two degrees Celsius target. So then how are we going to do it? Well, the IPCC, and let me remind you, this is the leading authority on climate science, says that if we combine biofuels with carbon capture and storage, we could actually remove carbon from our atmosphere. And this approach theoretically has enough potential to get us back down to 450 parts per million. This is called BECCS, Bioenergy Carbon Capture and, and Storage. And this is the key technology that could help us step back from the cliff's edge. Let me show you how this would work with, with a few, with a few uh, diagrams. Uh, this first diagram is a diagram of traditional fossil fuel combustion. Uh, roughly speaking, we take fossil fuels out of the ground, burn them to produce energy, and then release the carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. This is carbon positive, and this is the problem we need to solve. Carbon capture and storage, uh, for comparison, takes those carbon emissions and puts them back underground where the fossil fuels came from. Uh, this is carbon neutral. It stops aggravating the problem, it stops filling the bathtub, but it doesn't actually remove any carbon dioxide from our atmosphere. 
This next diagram uh, portrays biofuels. With biofuels, you're growing a lot of plants that can take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere as they grow, and you burn them to produce energy. The carbon dioxide normally goes back to the atmosphere in most biofuel plants, but remember that that's where it came from in the first place, that's where the plants took it. So this is actually organic carbon, not fossil carbon, and the whole process is carbon neutral, just like CCS. But now, if we combine the two, interesting things happen. If you grow plants that absorb carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and burn them to get energy, and then capture the carbon dioxide and put it underground, this system is now carbon negative. Uh, now, this is not done on any significant scale yet. There are only three small plants right, this, that, right now that are doing this full process, uh, but they are given a lot of importance in the IPCC reports because this is essential to two degrees Celsius pathways. Most of the CCS projects and biofuel projects that are out there today are not linked with each other, but they are helping develop and test the technological components that we're going to need to build the full system. Uh, before I go further, I know that I'm getting some truck noises and, and plane noises over on this end. Is it disturbing people? Should I shut my window before going on? Uh, Kathy is shaking her head, so does that mean we're good? I'm okay. If there's a problem, people tell me in the chat box, okay? Okay. All right. Okay. Um, so, uh, the, this is, this is, uh, this is, if we link biofuels and carbon capture and storage system, uh, there are three projects that are currently doing that. The most important one of which, the closest one to really achieving the dream, is the Illinois Basin Decature Project which takes one-tenth of a megaton of carbon dioxide per year from an ethanol plant, so that's biofuels, and sinks it into a saline aquifer, which is a permanent, dedicated geological storage. The only thing that's wrong with this project is that the biofuel that they're using is corn, which competes with food production, so this can't scale. Uh, in order to build a carbon capture and storage on a large enough scale to meet our climate change targets, we're going to need to grow our biofuels on otherwise unproductive land, such as desert, and we're going to need to do it without using fresh water. So that's probably going to mean algae, although there's a few other options as well. But, uh, you know, this is not all that crazy science fiction uh, of an idea. Algae is currently grown to make uh, food additives and pharmaceuticals. And that gives us a stepping stone to biofuel production. Uh, biofuels from waste products will also help, like uh, this project that will use manure from the Toronto Zoo and waste food from a large food distributor to generate biogas. Uh, now this project, ZooShare, will not use CCS, nor will the, the algae farm that, that I was showing you in the last slide. But these are examples of biofuel technology that could be combined with CCS to become carbon negative. Biofuels from waste like this, from uh, uh, waste products, has very limited potential uh, because you're limited by the amount of waste available. Uh, but the little that we can do is very cost effective. The IPCC says that for concentration goals on the order of 430 to 550 parts per million carbon dioxide equivalent by 2100, so that's basically your two degrees Celsius target, BECCS forms an essential component of the response strategy for climate change in the majority of the scenarios in the literature. They are very positive about the impact that CCS could have on the climate change crisis. Unfortunately, environmental groups are presenting CCS in very different terms. Uh, in fact, they're copying the same language and techniques that climate deniers have used for decades to attack renewable energy. Uh, they say the, that uh, uh, the um, uh, CCS is so far too small to matter because we've only built a, a few small plants so far. Uh, they say that if to scale it up to really have an impact would cost billions of dollars. Uh, they say that, that all the projects that have been, gone, been built to date go over budget by a lot because it is, after all, new technology. Uh, 
These projects oftentimes will, oftentimes will have a local impact on the environment that may hurt wildlife. Uh, there are some side effects to these projects so far that in many cases may, uh, may, new, may uh, cancel out the benefits uh, that, that they're providing. Uh, and so far, all of the CCS projects that have been built have depended on government subsidies uh, to, to, to survive. But these talking points should all look familiar because this is exactly the same list that's been used against wind power and electric cars and hydro dams and nuclear power and solar power and pretty much every climate change solution that anyone's ever come up with. The fact is that fixing climate change, it will be hard and it will be expensive, but we can't let perfection be the enemy of the good. This is still a useful and even essential technology. Having said that, there are some serious criticisms of CCS that need to be addressed head on. It has been used to give the fossil industry an excuse to keep building new fossil fuel infrastructure. New coal plants are being sold as being CCS ready, which doesn't really mean anything. It just means that they've put together some paperwork showing that they've thought about CCS, but didn't actually do it. Even if you do build a new plant with real CCS, the carbon capture is not going to capture everything. Some of the emissions will leak out and go into the atmosphere. So the emissions still go up when you build new fossil fuel infrastructure with CCS. And I think the poster child for CCS greenwashing was the Kemper County Coal Gasification Plant, widely known as the flagship CCS project. This project would have actually increased the use of coal, increased carbon emissions, and presented costs and dangers comparable to nuclear power. It just got shut down just last June because of multi-billion dollar cost overruns. But really everything that was wrong with Kemper had to do with the coal gasification process. This plant never really represented the true potential of carbon capture. CCS does not need to be tied to coal gasification or to new fossil fuel infrastructure. Instead of building new plants, we can retrofit carbon capture onto existing conventional coal plants. Saskatchewan's Boundary Dam is an example of that. Unit 3 was built in 1970, and it's now the, first, the world's first coal plant to be fitted with carbon capture and storage. There's a second one now, by the way, the Petra Nova project in the United States, but Canada was first. Retrofit projects genuinely reduce emissions, while the workers at the plant and the coal mine get to keep their job, nobody has to be retrained, and uh, this approach reuses some expensive assets, the coal plant, instead of leaving it stranded and having the company go bankrupt. However, Boundary Dam is open to another legitimate criticism of CCS, which has to do with where the carbon dioxide goes after, cap after capture. The carbon dioxide from Boundary Dam and most CCS projects to date is used for enhanced ore recovery. That means that they pump the carbon dioxide into depleted oil fields to extract more oil out of it. Uh, this should properly be called carbon capture and utilization. Uh, that, uh, CCU has made these projects commercially viable before we had a carbon tax, but it also makes oil cheaper because supply goes up. We have better options to store carbon dioxide without, produ without producing more fossil fuels. For example, uh, you can put carbon dioxide in a saline aquifer. The Aquastore and Quest projects do exactly that in Canada. Quest is the largest saline aquifer CCS project in the world. Uh, it takes uh, carbon dioxide from the Scottford oil sands upgrader and, uh, and, uh, and puts that permanently underground. When you inject carbon dioxide into pressurized water underground, the carbon dioxide dissolves into the water, just like carbonation in a, in a soft drink. That makes the underground water more acidic, 
Uh, so that raises a concern that the acid could dissolve the rock capping the formation and allow the carbon dioxide to return to the surface. Right now, we don't really have enough data to know for sure how much carbon we can store in these saline aquifers and for how long. But there's really no way to know that without actually trying it, without pumping carbon dioxide down there and seeing if it stays. But results from the oldest projects to date do give us hope. Uh, in Norway, they've been pumping one megaton per year into the Atsira saline aquifer since 1996. This is the oldest saline aquifer project in the world because Norway was one of the first countries to adopt the carbon tax in 1991. They've been monitoring that site, uh, the, the Atsira Aquifer, with seismometry and gravitometry and seafloor surveys. Uh, and so far, uh, the, the carbon dioxide storage seems stable. Uh, I hope you can see my, my cursor on the screen. I forgot to make it bigger, uh, but on, you can see it, great. Okay, on, uh, on, this is a seismograph. And over here in this area, this area these uh, blue and yellow lines uh, are the uh, the carbon dioxide that's being stored there. So with the techniques that they, can, they have, they can actually uh, see the carbon dioxide, see how much is there, and verify that it's not leaking out. There are real problems with carbon capture and storage. The potential for greenwashing, the enhanced oil recovery producing more oil, and questions about longevity of the storage system. But there are ways to address these problems and get real benefit out of this technology. But even if we solve the technical problems, we also need to look at the financial problems. Carbon capture and storage is never going to be a money maker on its own. CCS power plants will only be deployed if they are either required by regulation or the cost differential between them and their unabated counterpart is overcome. Uh, they're always going to be more expensive than simply dumping your carbon dioxide into the atmosphere through a smokestack. Boundary Dam in Saskatchewan was retrofitted with carbon capture and storage because of federal regulations that prohibited the continued operation of, of uh, coal plants be, beyond 2030, I think the limit is. Uh, but we've heard economists tell us over and over again that regulations like this are an expensive and inefficient way to reduce emissions. CCL prefers a carbon pricing scheme that lets the free market decide the most efficient solutions. The Canadian framework uh, for carbon pricing, if Saskatchewan adopts it, uh, would charge a downstream price on emissions, a little different from what CCL proposes, so under the Canadian framework, Boundary Dam would be exempt from the carbon price as long as they keep capturing carbon. However, there would be nothing to encourage Boundary Dam to switch to using biofuels instead of coal and remove carbon from the atmosphere. Citizens Climate Lobby proposes something different. Put a carbon fee upstream instead of downstream. So put, it, put the fee upstream at the mine head uh, but if you do that, then, boundary, then the Boundary Dam project would pay the same high price for coal as a coal plant with a regular smoke, uh, smokestack, and they'd have no incentive to keep the carbon capture system running. So we need something else in addition to just a fee at the wellhead. What I would propose is that the nearby Aquastore Saline Aquifer project be offered a carbon credit for each ton of carbon that they sink into the ground. They could then compete against the Weyburn enhanced oil recovery field to buy carbon dioxide from Boundary Dam, and that would then give the Boundary Dam money to cover its carbon capture costs. Boundary Dam would buy coal at market rates, which would be high because the Westmoreland mine would have to pay for the, the carbon fee at the mine head. So overall, the carbon would flow through the system uh, this way. Uh, the fee is applied when it comes through the mine, it's burned at the power plant, and then a credit would be given to Aquastore when the carbon goes back underground, uh, while the money goes in the opposite direction. The money is given to Aquastore, 
Uh, it's essentially paid to Sask Power to buy the carbon dioxide, which then uh, uses part of the money to pay for higher priced coal, which is charged a fee that goes back to the government. If you set up the fee and dividend this way, then all coal plants are gonna to want to install carbon capture and storage so they can sell their carbon dioxide to storage projects. But remember, the ultimate goal is to set up a financial system that will encourage bioenergy carbon capture and storage. If you're giving credit to a carbon dioxide uh, permanent storage system like Aquastore, that, that will inject money into the system that can pay for the carbon capture regardless of where they get their fuel from. And then the carbon fee on, on coal will encourage power plants to burn biofuels instead of coal. As the fee and credit amount rises, bioenergy carbon capture and storage becomes much more profitable than traditional fossil fuel systems. So uh, that brings us to the end of my presentation. Uh, and uh, I'm going, that leaves us uh, with a good half an hour for, to, to address questions. Please get your, your questions ready. Uh, for, uh, for the question and answer period, I think that we can, we can use the, uh, the, the raise hand system in, in, uh, uh, in Zoom. Uh, in your, on your Zoom screen, if you hover the mouse over the screen, you'll see some buttons pop up at the bottom. There's one button that says participants. If you click on that, then in the participant tab that shows up on the right, there should be a button that says raise hand. And if you click on that, you'll get, uh, Kathy will see you and, and will uh, uh, we'll unmute you and uh, you'll be able to ask me your questions. While you get your questions ready, uh, there are three questions that were submitted ahead of time that uh, I'll, I'll, get to, uh, I'll get to first. Uh, the first question we had was from Stephanie Grout. Uh, she said that uh, Brad Wall's argument is that the people of Saskatchewan already pay an implicit carbon tax of $60 a ton by subsidizing carbon capture and storage, and that mitigation payment should be recognized by the federal government. Uh, is CCL supporting this position, she asks. Well, uh, the short answer is yes, CCL supports all reductions of carbon dioxide emissions. So, you know, whenever any politicians take steps in the right direction, uh, even if it's baby steps, we want to acknowledge and appreciate that. However, we also have to point out that Saskatchewan is only paying $60 a ton on 1% of its emissions that would otherwise have been released in the atmosphere if it hadn't been captured. Other provinces' carbon price covers 70 to 80% of their emissions. CCL believes that carbon pricing coverage should be as broad as possible, eventually going up to 100% of the economy. Our second question uh, is from Laura Sachs. This was a two-part question. I'll start with the first one. She says, uh, in the Laser Talk CCS in Canada, numbers are presented on carbon capture and storage in the world and in Canada. How much of that is true storage versus utilization? So that's a little bit hard to, to pick apart, but roughly 10% of the world's carbon capture and 20% of Canada's carbon capture goes to dedicated geological storage. So dedicated geological storage, that means that that is definitely true long-term storage that doesn't produce any new fossil fuels. But uh, CCS or CCU is not really a binary thing. There's a bit of a spectrum in between. Uh, even in CCU, some of the carbon does wind up being stored permanently. Uh, and there are some approaches like enhanced geothermal systems where uh, the carbon is genuinely stored underground for, uh, for uh, hundreds of years. Uh, so, but the main reason for do that, doing that is really the utilization. So uh, there are some, there are some, there's a gray line to look at there. But the second part of her question was, when public money is used for extracting more, uh, more fossil fuels, isn't that a fossil fuel subsidy? Well, put simply that way, then the obvious answer is yes. But the accounting of uh, subsidies is always open to some interpretation. Uh, the, uh, you know, take, take the case of Boundary Dam, which received a subsidies to build a carbon capture system, which is now feeding enhanced oil recovery. Uh, 
is that is that a subsidy to fossil systems? Well, you know, some people would argue that uh, what uh, the, the, what drives carbon, uh, what drives oil production, is really demand. Uh, so the, the oil would be coming out out of the ground anyway, whether it comes from an enhanced oil recovery field or some other field. So you, so some would say you're not having much of an impact. The truth is somewhere in between. You would need a generalized equilibrium model to, to figure that out. Uh, another way to look at it is that the subsidy was really given for uh, developing the technology, which could then be rerouted away from the Weyburn enhanced oil recovery and towards the, aquif the Aquistor uh, saline aquifer project, which would produce permanent storage. So is this a is this a fossil fuel subsidy or a carbon capture and storage subsidy? Uh, it, it, that, that, uh, that, that's open to interpretation. The third question that we have is, is quite complex. Uh, the, this one I edited quite a, down quite a bit for brevity, but I hope I still got the gist of it. Uh, CCS does not seem to be a moneymaker. Uh, if this is true, then carbon capture and storage would need to be a public venture, Carol Lavallee said. Uh, how can we guarantee that this public venture is never sold as governments tend to do with crown corporations, land, et cetera, when they need cash? All right, so uh, there's a few, quite a few things to unpack here. Uh, let's start with a simple answer. Uh, if it's not a moneymaker, then no one's going to buy it. Problem solved. But I'm well aware that that's a glib answer. Uh, I think that what you're really worried about here is what if governments sell the entire Boundary Dam power plant and private industry decides to simply shut down the carbon capture system and operate it as a regular coal plant as it was before, spewing carbon into the sky. Well, in that situation, a CCS system could make money in private hands uh, by selling carbon dioxide to a storage project like Aquastore that would get a credit from the government for each ton of carbon dioxide sequestered. But then you could still ask the question, what happens if governments stop giving the credits to Aquastore because they want to save money? And that's possible. Uh, you have to realize that there's never any guarantee that future governments will not roll back our progress to date. Even if the carbon capture and storage system was government owned, uh, when, what if the government chooses to save money by not maintaining it, letting it break down and letting carbon emissions escape? The only guarantee we have that, that we can get for a, a permanence is by getting bipartisan support. And there's great story to exemplify that from the solar panels on top of the White House. You know, Jimmy Carter had solar panels in, uh, in, on, installed on the White House. And in later years, a different administration, Ronald Reagan's, had them removed. But in later years, uh, the Republicans became big fans of, uh, of solar power because of, it, of what it could do for, in terms of energy efficiency and energy independence. And it was George W. Bush's administration uh, that had the solar panels put back up. Obama expanded on the project, and now they're still there. This is the key to getting permanent solutions for climate change, getting bipartisan support. Uh, we, and that's why citizens' climate lobbies approach is so important. We have to talk to conservatives and liberals and NDP and convince them all to get on the same page in order to make permanent progress. That's, uh, those are the three pre-submitted questions, and I'd be happy to, to take more. Okay, before we have some great questions in the chat, um, okay. but I was wondering if any of the people whose question you answered um, had any further points of clarification before we go on to the chat questions. Is that okay? Sure. So um, I can't see everybody. Laura? Okay. Um, Okay, so Laura, um, do you have any qu questions or are you satisfied with your answer? Okay, good. And Carol, Carol, are you good? All right. And I don't see Stephanie on the call. So that's wonderful. Okay, so we have a 
two questions in the chat so far. Um, uh, the first one goes to Raleigh. Raleigh, could you unmute your phone and ask a question, please? Thank you, uh, Kathy. And uh, thank you, Yannick, for uh, a very good uh, presentation. I, I'm just learning a whole bunch of uh, new material on CCS, and that's uh, quite informative. Thank you very much. And uh, I also took the, uh, the privilege of uh, uh, screening some of your slides. I hope you don't mind. I'm always looking for good material, and certainly those slides were very good. Yeah, I can share uh, material if you'd like. Sure. Okay. Sure. Uh, personally, I, I I think that the future is in uh, uh, you know transition to clean technology. Um, that said, I know that will take time, and the time, of course, is is our enemy right now. And so I do know that we have to to uh, use every possible solution at hand, uh, including. Um, you know, carbon neutral, uh, car carbon uh, revenue neutral, carbon pricing, and CCS, and, and and everything we have in our arsenal. But do you think that focusing on CCS might have a negative effect or slow down the clean energy revolution? Uh, well, this goes to the risk of greenwashing. I think uh, definitely CCS uh, is not a substitute for uh, for renewables, uh, the, especially if you're talking about fossil CCS. Uh, we should continue to be opposed to new fossil fuel plants, uh, even if they have carbon capture and storage. We should continue to be opposed to new uh, fossil fuel pipelines and, and other fossil fuel infrastructure. Uh, carbon capture and storage's value it only comes if you're if you're uh, uh, retrofitting it onto existing uh, the uh, uh, fossil fuel infrastructure to avoid having to simply write it off, uh, or if if you're if you're attaching it to a biofuel system. And I don't know if you would consider biofuels to be part of the uh, part of the clean energy world that we're moving towards, but uh, I do, I do. Okay, yeah. So uh, we, we it's it's we've got to to get away from we've 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 got a way we've got a uh, we we are going to need a whole portfolio solution whole portfolio mm -hmm. solutions in order to make this work. Uh, there are some solutions that need to be excluded from that portfolio, like new coal plants, uh, but. Uh, we can't get to two degrees Celsius without CCS, so it needs to be part of that solution. So does wind, so does hydro, so does solar. Thank you. Tom, you're next. Are you still there? You gotta unmute. There you go. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm just curious, Yannick, great talk. Thanks. What percentage of the carbon dioxide emissions uh, from the Boundary Dam? Uh, coal plant are actually captured. Um, you mentioned that not all the emissions are captured. Yeah, uh, so uh, uh, Tom's questions was really soft there. In case uh, some people's volume isn't as loud, he was asking what percentage of the emissions from Boundary Dam are actually captured. Uh, so as of 2016, uh, they captured about um, uh, 800 kilotons and released uh, 300. So that's, that's about three quarters, I think. Uh, the system is still not operating optimally. Uh, they're still, they're, they've, it's shut down currently as they make some, some upgrades to try to refit it to make, meet the original design specs. If they succeed, uh, they should be able to capture about 90% of the emissions out of that generating station. Thanks. Okay, Mark, are you there with Anita? I don't know what your question is, but you can go ahead. We'll see if you're next in the queue. Oh, okay, thanks, uh, Kathy. Can you hear me? Yeah, we yeah. can hear you. 
Okay, okay. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Yannick. That was a very comprehensive overview and, and I learned a lot. Um, so my, my question is about photosynthesis. Um, photosynthesis is a, effectively carbon capture and storage. Um, as the, the carbon dioxide in the air is combined with um, H2O, that creates glucose, which is sent down the plant and the root exuded into the soil. Um, I, I, from, from what I've read and, and, and some of the research I'm doing myself, it seems like your half a ton per hectare um, is low for uh, perennial grasses like on pasture. It, it might be, pro, uh, um, um, the number might be closer to what you would see in crops because of all the exposed soil, but where you have um, grasses, permanent grasses and grasslands and pasture land where it's being naturally fertilized by the manure, um, what I've read, the, the potential is much more than that. I'm just wondering where you got that uh, half a ton per hectare number. Well, the, uh, my source was, uh, was on my slide. Um, and uh, out of what's av uh, in, available in the scientific literature, that was actually on the high end. Um, I know that there's a lot of optimistic things about soil carbon that, that are out there on Facebook and on YouTube. Uh, but uh, a lot of that is not peer-reviewed science. And in fact, efforts to put it through the peer review process fail because of uh, significant uh, problems in the measurement of the carbon content of the soil. Um, you know, in, in what, in one of the things you said there, uh, I think shows a bit of a misunderstanding of the science that you said that the plants exude the carbon, doc, the, the carbon into the soil. No, that's not how it works. The, uh, the plants absorb the, the, the carbon dioxide from, from uh, the atmosphere and photosynthesis splits off the oxygen and the carbon becomes the structure of the plant. You know, the, bi the, the biomass of the plant grows by absorbing carbon from the atmosphere. And the only way that the, the, uh, the, the carbon gets locked in the soil is because of, of roots that grow down there and because of manure uh, that, that is added and, uh, in, into the store, into the soil. Uh, but this is not a permanent carbon storage system. Uh, roots decompose, manure decomposes, uh, and release that carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere uh, when, when they do. And oftentimes when, when they'll decompose, they'll, they won't produce pure carbon dioxide. They'll also produce methane, which is a much more powerful greenhouse gas. Uh, so when the decomposition of the soil organic matter, uh, it, uh, when the rate of decomposition becomes equal to the rate at which new organic matter is added, then the soil is saturated and is not capturing any additional net carbon from the atmosphere. You have as much carbon going out as you do, do coming in. Okay, that's, um, you know, I, I, I've got a different understanding than, than, than some of what you said, but uh, a lot of that I would agree with. But the, the actual, the, the microbes in the soil are, are part of the carbon in the soil. So um, they, they're carbon-based entities, and the way they get their carbon from is from the plant. So that's my understanding, is that, is that the plant does exude the carbon into the soil that's picked up by the soil microbes. That's the only way they can get the carbon, um, particularly if you've got deep-rooted grasses um, with microbes deep down in the soil. The only way they're going to get that carbon is, is, from, is from the plant root. So... I, I think it's, I, it, I'll just throw it, I think it merits a bit more study on specifically on grasslands as opposed to crops. Well, um, for sure there is always room for more study. Um, the, um, uh, the, but, you know, if, if, if we're relying on, on microbes, that's still going to be a small amount of biomass, right? We're, we're, you're, you're still going to... You 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 still got to deal with conservation of mass. Uh, the the amount of carbon sequestered in the ground can is simply is basically the amount of biomass that you have in the ground, roots and microbes and and manure included. Um, I I um 
you know, I, I'd love to be able to say, yeah, we've got a solution, but uh, a lot of scientists have looked at this and I'm, I'm happy to share my share resources uh, with you after the talk to, to, sh to point you to some references that I'm looking at. Uh, I, my address is uh, ytrotier, Y-T-R-O-T-T-I-E-R, -T -T -E at alum.mit.edu. Uh, and, you know, the IPCC has, has reviewed the scientific studies from around the world, and what they've concluded is that the, the potential just isn't there. Okay, thanks. I, I would appreciate more information. Sure. Uh, Anita, you have Yannick's email to to share with Mike, Mark, I mean, yes? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Okay, Tom has another question in the queue, but because he's already asked one, I'm gonna let somebody else ask first. If you're too shy, this is your chance. Otherwise, Tom gets question number two. Anyone? Okay, go ahead, Tom. I don't see anybody. Uh, yeah, yeah, I could, uh, regarding the, you mentioned the credits, uh, and the, my understanding of the Pan-Canadian framework is that there's um, the initials for it are OBA, but I can't remember what it stands for. Anyway, is there any allowance for anything like uh, credits for CCS uh, in that OBA part of the, the technical description of the Pan-Canadian framework that you're aware of? Not explicitly, but it is a downstream carbon price. Uh, which means that the the uh, the the fees are assessed based on carbon dioxide actually released into the atmosphere, based on uh, each each fossil fuel facility uh, own books. So a a facility like Boundary Dam would declare uh, very low emissions. They they would not they, they would not declare the emissions that were captured. Uh, and therefore, they would not have to pay any, any fee on the captured emissions. Uh, the criticism that I have of, of the Canadian framework uh, is that there's nothing in there to encourage biofuels. Um, okay, because there's not a... Um, so there's a price for the emissions, but there's no, no explicit credit for using for using biofuels. Well, there's, there's no, yeah, there's, yeah. So a, a CCS plant would have zero emissions, doesn't have to pay the fee. A biofuel plant, a normal biofuel plant would have zero emissions, wouldn't have to pay the fee, that's fine. But now what if you have a biofuel plus CCS plant? It still doesn't pay the fee. It's, it, is, it is treated financially the same way as a regular CCS plant or regular biofuel plant. Uh, so, so it has no advantage over the other two, even though it's more expensive than the other two. So there's really no credit mechanism um, right. under the Pancanadian framework. Okay, thank you. Can I ask a question? Sure. Okay, firstly, thank you for such a lovely education starting in June with me all the way till now. I love it. I'm a super science geek and I love how much I've learned about CCS. So it's been amazing. And so in Climate Lobby's perfect world where we get that upstream tax on carbon pollution, this is what I'm hearing and I wanna make sure I get this right. Without crediting, for true CO2 sequestration, i.e. not emitting CO2 at coal power plants um, or, 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 any, or any plant, um, even a biofuel plant, they I could, you are, right? they will sell, the, it, they will be financially um, better off selling the CO2 for enhanced oil recovery without a, a rebate. Is that right. what I'm hearing? Yeah, that's right. Because right now, the Weyburn Enhanced Oil Recovery Field is paying $30 a ton for carbon dioxide. So if, if, uh, if, if, if uh, pure storage projects like Aquastore want to, uh, want to buy the carbon dioxide off of Boundary Dam, they're going to have to, to, to pay more than that. 
Okay, just this really makes us all think. But thank you for that. Um, is that Frank? Oh, that was. Uh, uh, I actually, Kathy, I'm not sure how to get through to you. I've had my hand up. I've been sending uh, chat messages, but I'm not sure if my system is working. Oh, sorry. Oh, I, I have never seen the, the raised hand icon before, but I now see the raised hand in John's screen. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Anyway, my, if I can put my question in, it, it follows on from the last discussion. Uh, should Aquastore, I, I, it occurs to me that the credit that Aquastore gets should not be quite as much as the carbon tax because there's some risk. It's not as good. In other words, this system, I mean, it could be a plus, but it's not as good as not producing the carbon dioxide in the first place, which I wish you avoid the full carbon tax. So by using this system, maybe you should get a credit for, say, 90% of the carbon tax. I'm, I'm not sure how it could... Uh, yeah. uh, do, you, do you get me? Yeah, I, I do, but uh, I don't think that's necessary uh, because you'd already get uh, um, uh, you already get hit by the inefficiency of the carbon uh, capture system. So, for example, you know, in Boundary Dam's case, uh, Boundary Dam only captures uh, ninety percent of I its carbon, and actually, so far, they've only been able to get to seventy-five percent. So, if they're buying coal that has a fee on it and then selling carbon dioxide to, to Aquastore, uh, they're only going to be getting refunded for 75% or 90% of the fee that they paid on the coal already. So there's, there's already a, a reduction simply because of the technical efficiency of the carbon capture system. And but, but, sorry, for, but if they don't recover, what, that 10%, they shouldn't get a credit for that 10%. I mean, the lighting, right. if they recover 90% and can't recover 10%, the 10%, they definitely shouldn't get a credit for it. Agreed, yeah, okay. But you're saying... I'm, say, I'm, I'm saying that even the part they do recover, there is some risk. I don't know what the risk is. Maybe over time we'll, we'll decide there, there is no uh, you know, significant risk. But right now, it occurs to me that it is not foolproof that you won't get some leaps of some kind. But I'm not totally sure how to handle it quantitatively. I just wanted to put the issue on the table. That's, that's a good point. Um, the, uh, okay, so even for the 90% of captured carbon, they shouldn't get 90% of the credit because there's a, per, a certain percentage risk that the carbon dioxide could come back up in the atmosphere. Um, right. I, I agree in principle, but I don't know of any way to know what that risk is other than try it and, and see. So uh, it's an unknown number right now. I mean, the carbon dioxide in these storage projects has never leaked back up to the surface. So it, it's, it's like trying to, to guess your risks of a nuclear meltdown before you get your first one. Um, it, it's, it's very much guesswork. Uh, the, um, uh, and the other thing too is that uh, net, the projects, the technologies, you know, there's a few different storage technologies that are possible too. Uh, there's saline aquifer, there's, uh, basaltic rock, there's uh, depleted gas wells, um, and the technologies that have the least data behind them should normally be considered to have the most risk. So they would get the greatest cutback in credits, which means that there would be least, the least development of the things that might have greater potential, but are risky. You know, it, part of the thing you need is money to, to fund the research um, and maybe that should come through a different channel um, mm. i understand what you're saying in principle but i see problems with it as well yeah okay 
Okay, it's one minute to, to the top of the hour. So oh, I see that Frank has a, still ha has his hand up, eh? Oh, he does. Yeah, do we have time for one more question? I'm okay if you're okay. Yeah. Frank? I think I'm unmuted, am I? Yeah, you're good now. Wonderful. Can, well, Yannick, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> As usual, Yannick, uh, thank you for the presentation. It's very technical material and it's hard to do. So I appreciate that. Question. So the laser talk reads, carbon capture and storage is a general term for a range of different industrial processes that can separate carbon dioxide emissions from smokestacks and store it underground indefinitely. Sorry about that. It's nice. Hey, it's eight o'clock in the Black Forest. What can I say? My mom is happy. Uh, indefinitely is toxic waste. So the idea is, again, the uh, CO2 emissions get stored as toxic waste in the soil. Mm -hmm. So, Yannick, broadly speaking, carbon fee and dividend aims to limit atmospheric toxic emissions. Does adding toxic effluent into the earth give you any pause, any cause for concern? No, no, it doesn't. Uh, because there's already lots of carbon dioxide underground. Uh, and where you run into a, a pollution or toxicity problem is when you're putting something into the environment that wasn't there before. But right now, the oil and gas industry, when they go drilling for, for, uh, for oil and gas, they routinely encounter pockets of oil carbon dioxide. So, you know, for one thing, that's, that's part of the evidence we have to prove that it is possible to store carbon dioxide for millions of years because the, the carbon dioxide that's there is, is, is that old. Um, and the, all, the, all the good ideas that people are coming, coming with for permanent storage uh, would be to put it in places deep underground, very deep underground, below all of the freshwater reserves and uh, in the zones where you would normally find carbon dioxide deposits anyway. So I'm not so concerned about putting things there that are already there to begin with. Okay, we're only two minutes over. That was fantastic. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Yannick. Okay. Um, just a reminder, see, Citizens Climate Lobby will continue to lobby for carbon fee and dividend as written on our website. And we will be looking with this education that Yannick has given us that will allow us to keep our ear to the ground to what the experts are saying. And maybe year two down the road, who knows, we've got to listen to the experts, get the consensus. We'll reconsider maybe how to incorporate CCS into what we lobby for, but right now, that's in the future. Is that clear to everyone? We're just sticking to what, we're, what we already have on our website, and this is an amazing education. Um, I thank Yannick, Yannick so much. Uh, having less prejudice against CCS is so important, and you gave us the right framework. Thank you so much. I'd be happy to stay on longer if, uh, if people have more questions. I see that Penny Henderson has, uh, has her hand up. So it's, uh, I'll stay as long as people have questions. All right. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. I'm so happy right now. <laughs>